Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. So, this is be the first to say something. So, I'm being the first to say something. This is supposed to be live. And what I'm doing here so is that I'm testing. This is be the first to say something. So, I'm being the first to say something. This speaker. dot com This is Dr. Dennis L. Waters Sr. I'm on Spreaker.com, which is a podcast um, vehicle that we have use of. And I'm in the midst of seeking to understand exactly how to work this particular um, podcast, the machinery for it, how it works, and what goes about doing it. And as I speak, it's working with me to know exactly how to go about this process and make it work for me. So...
I'm making sure that it works. I'm able to speak and understand what takes place, who is um, able to hear what it's doing, how it's working. One of the things that is motivating me in regard to life at this particular point in time is that I have of late heard a number of individuals talk about the challenges that they have in life is that I am convinced that there are some statements that are found in the Bible that are correct. Those statements have led me to believe, one, that there is one God. That God is called by a number of names. No matter what name that God is called by, whether it is Allah, uh, which is what takes place in the Muslim faith, as I understand it, whether it is Krishna uh, in the Hindu faith, or whether it is God, Elohim, which is in the Old Testament, or Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit, that God is the same God. We are calling that God the one God, by the name that is associated with our particular culture or belief system. That makes it possible, just like there is one air that we breathe. It makes it possible for us all to live on the one earth and that we are part of the one humanity. This one humanity is the child of God, the people of God. We are all the one humanity, the one child of God, and are the one body of God, if you will, and that we are all growing up to the full statue of God, or to be like the Father, or to be like God. We are all made in the image of God. And I believe that is what the makers or the writers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America were seeking to capture. When they wrote those documents, they were seeking to capture that as best they could with their understanding at the time. They were drawing on the writings of others individuals like John Locke and others, those philosophers that they were acquainted with, those philosophers had come as far as they possibly could from other ancient philosophers. And even those ancient philosophers had only come so far and they only had so much understanding of what were original documents as far as they understood it. But they did the very best that they come. They said things like, well, like we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these, they did not say that we have all of the understanding. They said among these, which meant that there were others that certain inalienable rights, among those rights, not all of the rights that they could articulate, were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so they put down in a a concise way as much as they understood. In other words, they left something unfinished. They began but it was up to those who followed them to actually 
continue what they had started. And so we all had to keep growing and keep going. And that is pretty much what is taking place as far as the entire race, human race, and the planet is doing. That's what's taking place, is that we are continuing to evolve. We are continuing to grow. And it's vital that that takes place. And there are so many things that are taking place. It's inevitable that we will continue to grow. No matter what happens, we will continue to grow. There are things that are taking place now, such as the pictures that are going forth and that are coming forth as far as the telescopes that are being launched or have been launched into what we call outer space. One was a Hubble telescope that was launched so many years ago, and we had the pictures that we marveled at when we first saw that particular telescope. The other one, which I believe is called the Webb Telescope, W-E-B-B, that telescope has sent back additional pictures. And the scientists, astronomers, and others, those individuals who study this material, are talking about the magnification. And the first telescope, the Hubble, showed a particular picture, and it looked amazing at that point. But the second telescope has a magnification that opens up again that same space that shows things that were not seen. They were there, but they were not seen from the pictures that were sent back with the first telescope, with the Hubble telescope. And it keeps magnifying it and magnifying it and magnifying it. The same thing is taking place when it comes to what's taking place with things that have to do with the metaverse, as they call it now. And they are talking about the aspect of being able to live in a certain kind of way virtually and the metaverse. And what I find to be amazing there is that the idea that an individual will be able to, in a way, learn virtually, learn virtually. And before individuals, when they were talking about that, it seemed really theoretical. But what they're saying now is that it may be that we will be able to learn virtually, but the experience and the learning will be something that is real. And when I saw this aspect about being able to be engaged and listen to Mark Anthony and his speech and his debate and things like that, I thought about Caesar's death, Caesar's death in a Shakespearean play and Mark Anthony talking about the death of Caesar. It's a Shakespearean play. And there's Mark Anthony's speech when he is talking about Caesar. And that particular play is just an awesome play to begin with. But Mark Anthony's speech when he talks about Caesar, and Caesar had been killed because he was someone who was ambitious, but for Mark Anthony, Caesar was his friend. And I thought about how it would be to actually have the place where you are hearing him speak and he's talking about his friend. Others, his, the people who killed him saw him one way, but Mark Anthony saw him a totally different way. And to be in the midst of that, to feel that, and I've been someone who has watched movies and things like that. And I have felt, thank God, I have felt like I was there. But now that moves that to another place, to another moment. All of that is possible even more so in the metaverse. Some people will be fearful. 
of what is going to take place. But a baby does not remain a baby. We are being asked to grow up. There are people who are afraid of what the future will be like. There are many people who are afraid of what the future will be like. There are whole generations of people who are afraid. I actually had to go back or chose to go back in a certain kind of way. In 1976, I was in a class that was doing black history. And part of that was going back and searching for my ancestry. I went to the National Archives and I was one of three people out of a class of 30 who was blessed to locate a census record of one of my ancestors. I had not known of the individual had never heard that person's name, but I found a record of one of my ancestors from an early time. And all of a sudden, here was this individual that I had not ever, to my remembrance, heard his name before. But not only did I hear his name, but I heard the record of his wife's name. And I got that record and I read it and I was so glad to hear of the person who was my great grandfather. And I thought I was done with that. But later, about 20, 30 years later, I was invited in a certain kind of way by another individual. And I had been invited by virtue of another kind of call. And I went back and searched again, and all of a sudden, an entire new world opened up for me. Entire new world. And what I discovered was that I was biracial by virtue of birth. I tell people that I started out with a desire to find my African roots. But what I discovered were my English roots. All of a sudden, it was totally different from what I had expected. I had become really totally dedicated to this country. I'd already served in the United States Army. And I already decided that I am for America, pro-American. This is my country. But all of a sudden, I discovered all kinds of things that my ancestors, my ancestors, had fought in the American Revolutionary War. It was a major, major thing to discover that my ancestors had fought in the American Revolutionary War. And I became somebody that understood history from a totally different standpoint. That way, as far as I understood, they, as far as I understood it, were really Quakers when they initially came here or came. I am not clear about all of this, even to this day. I I'm still searching, I'm still looking, even as I go forward and understand what it is. So some of this may or may not be true because some of the records I don't have to this day. But what I'm saying is that I'm growing and I'm looking deeper and deeper into the aspect of who we are as individuals, the God self that is in each of us that God breathed into man the breath of life. I don't believe that's a historical statement. What I believe is that it is the way that some individuals, not just one individual, but some individuals sought to articulate. It's one way that some individuals sought to articulate that it's, which is beyond a human's ability to actually communicate this divine 
experience is just one way. There are other creation stories. And we have to be open to the way that other spiritual traditions articulate the same creation story. I look at it and I find it to be amazing. Here is the Gilgamesh epic story. It's a creation story. I'm not totally clear about the ones that come out of the Hindi religious tradition. I've, I've looked at the Bhagavad Gita. I'm not clear about others. There are those that come out of Africa in various places. I've read them. I've not totally understood them. I admit that. But I don't want to beat up on others and their creation stories. I want to practice as a person named Jesus the Christ, whom I've had the most experience studying. I want to practice unconditional love. That's where my heart is in this day and time. So that's why I'm here really, is that I'm in this world. I'm in this country. This is where I was born, the United States of America. And my ancestors fought. As far as I know, they have fought in every war that America has had. As far as I know. And this is the country that I consider to be my country. And so, however we got here, on the one hand, I could say that certainly my ancestors, as far as I know, may have been considered to be slaves in this country. I'm not even sure about that. Because at some point, there is a marital relationship before the end of slavery. Before the end of slavery. I, I don't know what the relationship was because those people would have traveled on or passed on before. But I know that one of my ancestors married a Caucasian woman. There's no question about that. I have the marriage license or the marriage certificate. I'm clear about that. This is my country. I'm clear about that. I belong here. My children belong here. I've gone to school here. And whoever is saying this idea about somebody being replaced and everything, I belong here. I want us to get along here. And I pray I, I continuously pray. I pray for us. We are one humanity. And so I wanted to do this podcast. Let me do one other thing. There is one God. There is one air. I, I heard someone talk about good air, bad air. I guess they are talking about polluted air and all of this other kind of stuff. There's a way scientifically that air migrates from one area to another area. And that needs to be understood. That that needs to be in there. And the weight of, I guess, polluted air, all of that kind of stuff. But how, however that is done, we are one humanity. And the United States of America has an opportunity to investigate how it is that we can best, best live together. We have an opportunity to investigate that. 
Dr. King, when he was in the Birmingham jail, spoke to the jailer. And he basically said to the jailer, you are in no better condition or situation than I am. The people who are telling you that you are better because you are Caucasian are just using that to pit us against each other. And that's how individuals, it's like we are fighting over crumbs, crumbs. And you can consider the death rate if you want to consider that. You can consider the financials. When you have individuals who are trillionaires, trillionaires, billionaires, you can consider the, the aspect of health care, all kinds of things that you can use. And all of this stuff, and you look at that and you think that somebody is looking at your interests, you got to consider again, are they really looking at your interests? We live in an abundant universe, an abundant universe. Yes, there are laws that work this universe. But look at your health, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, relational, all of those things. And when they speak of sp mental health, mental health and spiritual health are closely tied together. And people who've written already have related to the aspect that as a man think it, so is he. I think it was the individual that wrote that book talked about that basically a person reaps what they sow. It's not what somebody else sows. Nobody can take what is yours that you've earned from you. Nobody can do that. Nobody can do Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote a book called uh, article that deals with compensation. You, the universe rewards you. You reap what you sow. What you put in, you get out. Every farmer knows that. And so it's your amount of contribution to the universe that determines your reward. Your contribution determines your reward. Nobody can keep you from reaping what you sow. But you should not, I should not expect that I'm going to be unduly rewarded for the work of somebody else. The universe, God, spirit, has ordained it so. And it's wrong for one to expect that you or I I'm going to get something that somebody else has earned. No matter if it takes generations for that balance to be restored is wrong. Dr. King again said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That's a good thing for all of us. That is just a good thing for all of us. That it bends toward justice. And in this day and time, it is becoming a shorter arc. It's becoming so that it levels out. That in the same day, in the same time, it levels out. Why? Because we've got these, uh, these, these smartphones and is able to see people in the midst of doing what they're doing and people are thinking faster. And they can see and judge for themselves. And they say, we ain't stupid.
Wrong is wrong. Wrong is wrong. You got to be trained. You don't shoot somebody nine, shoot at somebody 90 times in like 90 seconds who doesn't have a gun. You just don't do that. It's wrong. Please, you don't want that happening to your own children. But reap what you sow. And the society, the nation, the world, the universe keeps a record of these things. We want to honor America. We want to understand that. Please, this is our country. Indeed, this is our world. And so that's basically, I'm just looking at it. I have started a spiritual center, Spirit of Victory and Praise, International Spiritual Center is what I call it. And we do spiritual law. Spiritual law, on the one hand, is called the law of attraction. And the law of attraction is something that I learned as far as something that is called. But it's the same thing I just said. You reap what you sow. It's called karma. It's all the same thing. My mama said, you make your bed hard, you got to lie in it. Well, if you make it right, so it's soft. So it is something that, um, you know, is good for your body. Then you still got to lie in it. You make it just right. You are the one that reap the benefits of that. And then she would say, birds of a feather flock together. Well, that's true. You want to be with people who want to be with you. You want to be with people. And then she would say, Iron sharpens iron. You want to be with people who make you better, who pick out your good traits and that help you to overcome the bad ones. Yes, all of those things, all of those things are the law of attraction. That the more you talk about it, the stronger it becomes. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. I was inside of a church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the, one of the founders of that church said, it is the law of nature, which means it's natural law. It's a natural law that when you talk about something, it magnifies. It magnifies. She says our thoughts and feelings are encouraged as we give them, encouraged and strengthened as we give them utterance. The more you talk about it, that's why the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. And as a man think it, so is he, which is the same thing. That whole thing is the law of attraction again. As a man think it, so is he. That's, I think it's Psalms 19. And so all of those things are right there. But when you package them so that you can sell them to others, you make it like it's something new and it works because, of, oh, law of attracts, that's something new. Law of attracts, something new, and you buy it because you highlight it for individuals. But the key is you practice it. You practice it. And what they have there is the aspect is that you continuously, continuously, which means you develop a habit or a discipline or blissipin, that sounds even better. Blissipin is something that moves you into bliss and you practice it. And what you do is that you have the whole aspect of somebody that holds you to accountability. You said that you were going to develop a habit. When you got a coach, this is what I am. The coach asks you continuously, are you doing what you promised you were going to do? Are you doing what you promised you were going to do? Are you doing what you promised you were going to do? Why would you do what you promised you were going to do? Because you have a goal. 
The destination must be worth the, the, the drive. The destination must be worth the drive. If you are not invested in it, then you don't have to take the drive. I have an individual that is working in the realm of real estate. And over the past few years, this individual has gotten award after award after award after award. And every award indicates in a particular kind of way that this individual is making more and more and more money. I have marveled at this person's success. She has understood the eight A's, which is my particular brand, eight A's. She's understood those eight A's and she is carrying them out faithfully. Her husband, actually, when I look at it, his brother came to me, he had a five page business plan. Whew, five pages. We worked through some stuff. He's got that five page business plan and just run that whole thing and developed it. It's amazing. It is amazing. That's accountability. That's one of the eight A's, accountability. Yep, it works. So you bring something that works, we have it work for you. That's what we do. So this is what we're talking about. Here's a, uh, an affirmation. Let me give you something here. This comes from a particular book. It is in line with what I'm talking about, and then I'll be done. It says, there's a powerful good. I know there's a powerful good, which is responding to me and bringing into my experience everything that is necessary for my unfoldment, to my happiness, to my peace, to my health, and to my success. I know there's a powerful good that enables me to help others and to bless the whole world. So I say quietly to myself, there's one life. That life is God. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. It is flowing through me, circulating in me. I am one with his rhythm. My heart beats with the pulsation of the universe in serenity, in peace, and in joy. My whole physical being is animated by the divine spirit. And if there's anything in it, in my life, that does not belong, it is cast out because there's one perfect life in me now. And I say to myself, I am daily guided so that I shall know what to do under every circumstance, in every situation. Divine intelligence guides me in love, in joy, and in complete self-expression. Designed that the law of good alone shall control me. I bless and prosper everything I am doing. I multiply every activity. I accept and expect happiness and complete success. Realizing that I am one with all people, I affirm that there is a silent power flowing through me and them, which blesses and heals and prospers and makes happy and glad their pathway. And realizing that the world is made up of people like myself, I bless the world and affirm that it shall come under the divine government of good, under the divine providence of love, and under the divine leadership of the supreme intelligence. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is my desire, especially the last, the last line. Realizing that the world is made up of people like myself, I bless the world and affirm that it shall come under the divine government of good, under the divine providence of love, and under the divine leadership of the supreme intelligence. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can send us an email at admin at real-coach.com, real, R-E-L, dash, coach, C-O-A-C-H, dot com. We'll send you this particular item, the power for good. There is a power 
for good. And just begin to say, repeat this affirmation and meditate on it. It'll change your life. I used for a period of time for years, actually, years. One text, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I know many people use it now. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. It changed my income. As I did that, I gave to the spiritual center or the church that I was in. It changed my life. People say all kinds of things about my life, but I, my parents were married to one another for 52 years. I helped to facilitate that and make it even better than it was, and it wasn't so good. But they stayed together on the situation they were in, and I helped them do that. There were things that were going on there that I know of, and I was able to remain in my first marriage over 30 plus years. I'm grateful for that. And I'm thankful for the stability of the homes that have come out of my home. And for those who have listened to me and heard me preach and teach, I know what God has done in my life. I heard a preacher say the other day, this amazing thing, and I want you to practice this not just with your own children, but I want you to practice this with everybody you meet. And it's a mighty powerful thing. It concerns the prodigal son. What he said was that the prodigal son had taken everything his father had. And then he ran away and basically lost everything that he had, except, except for one thing, and that was that he knew that he had a father. And that he decided one day he, he would get up and he would go home. And the father saw him, it says, a great way off. And that the father went out to meet him. And the father saw him and went out to meet him. And that he covered him, his son, with his own robe. Nobody, nobody ever saw that son as anything other than that father's son because he covered him with his own robe. Nobody ever saw him as anything other than that father's son. And I want you to do that for everybody. Not just your biological blood relatives or whatever. I want you to cover everybody. Everybody. Long before anybody ever sees anything that has to do with any pig pen. That's what Jesus Christ does for everybody. That's what the Father does for everybody. 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 Because we are all God's children. Everybody. Cover them totally, completely. A great way off. Great way off. Take care. God bless. I'll see this somewhere, I guess. It'll be wherever it is, but we'll try this again. Blessings. Bye-bye.